Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to A Gathering Place, brought to you by the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce, and I'm your host, Marilyn Hemingway, and we have our special guest here, Larry Rennie, Tom Rennie Thomas, and we're going to be talking about why Black folks are into jazz. You know, we talk about this quietly, but folks, we don't show up to the concerts, we don't show up to the live performances, not in mass, and this is American classical music as larry likes to say he's going to tell us more about that right after this opening hello i'm marilyn hemingway and welcome to the gathering place i said i'm stepping back because we have young voices who want to be heard and they're moving on something brandon is really important to you and your business even the basic type of technology you learn it all <laughs> um. <laughs> well, we're back, folks, and let's just jump right on in it and bring Larry in on with us. Hey, Larry, how are you? You're muted. There we go. We got you. Oh, you're back to mute again. There you go. Okay. There you go. We can hear you. All right, Larry, good right, to have cool. you here. How you doing? All right, good, good to see you again. I know it's been it's been about a year or so you came down. Yeah, I was in Georgetown. I enjoyed myself. Yes, yeah, so my beautiful hometown on the water, and you yeah, were down good here for the International Gala Film Festival. Yep, because you got some books, All so right. we're gonna talk about your books too. We're gonna talk about your books, but I brought you here. I'm going to give a little bit. You have an extensive history with jazz. I'm going to tell. I just don't bring anybody on here. We got somebody who knows what he is talking about. So just to give a little bit of who you are, um, Larry Rennie Thomas, a native of Wilmington, North Carolina. So he's Galagichi, y'all. He's Galagichi. Is a writer, radio announcer, a lecturer based in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, who has worked at seven radio stations and whose journalistic journalistic work has appeared in Downbeat magazine for you young folks y'all might know might not know Downbeat but Downbeat magazine was the magazine when it comes to music and the New York Times magazine your lecture Thomas lecture is on the Carolina Jazz Connection with Larry Thomas has been presented at schools colleges universities libraries and public places since 20 2008 he was named Jazz Hero in 2014 by the Jazz Journalist Association, received the fifth annual Donald Mead Legacy Jazz Griot Award at the Jazz Education Network in 2016, and has been a participant in the Downbeat Magazine Jazz Critic Poll since 2012. You are presently writing a book titled Carolina Shout, That Wonderful Soulful Blessing, The Carolina Jazz Connection. You are also a contributor to ejazznews.com and jazzcorner.com. You've worked with, uh, featured in documentary films, and we were just talking about one, Wilmington on Fire, and I called him Morgan. You received your MA in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and you've done further study at UNC Chapel Hill's Journalism Graduate School, and you are also currently the host of Sunday Night Jazz, on WCOM FM Chapel Hill, Carborough, North Carolina. It is good. I'm going to talk about your books later on in the show. I didn't get into the books that you've written, but you are definitely a jazz connoisseur, a very right. knowledgeable about jazz. And while you're on this show, glad that you're on, glad that you and I can reconnect. But you were on Facebook about three weeks ago and you were having a conversation with someone about um, why black folks are not into jazz. And you corrected me also in saying, you call jazz American classical music. That's one thing. 
Um, but most people hear jazz, they know jazz. But um, why aren't black folks into jazz when we created the jazz? We created American classical music. So so what happened along the way? Well, I'll tell you what happened. I was interviewing a drummer. His name is Art Blakey, very famous drummer. Uh, some years ago at Duke University, because I was in radio, I was able to get press passes and I would always go backstage whenever someone came to town. See, we're very fortunate here in this area because we have three major universities and all these universities um, somewhat compete because they bring almost every, almost every artist to town, you know. So one of the artists that they brought to town over Duke University was a drummer named Art Blakey. And some of you people who are who, who are checking the program out now maybe aren't familiar with him, but you could always I tell people they could Google it. Yeah. Art Blakey <laughs> little called Art Blakey and the Fab and the Jazz Messengers. I um went backstage and interviewed Art Blakey because I've been at it since 1978. Uh, my first paying gig as a radio announcer, I don't call it a DJ, I'm a radio announcer. My first paying gig was at a station called WDBS uh, over, over in Durham. It was actually owned by Duke University. And my first shift, my shift was from 2.30 a.m. until 6 a.m. It was very rough because I was in grad school. But, and I would notice in the process whenever we would have concerts that there were almost no African-Americans in the audience. Um, so that that question, that point always kind of bugged me. You know, I always wondered why that was the case. So I always thought it was a conspiracy. So that was the question that I posed to Art Blakey years ago when he was backstage. I said, is there a conspiracy to keep this music away from black people? And at the time he was backstage eating some chicken. And he had a roadie with him who was a white cat, a European. I don't like to call white people white people. I call them European. Who was okay. a European who handled his drums. He would set his drums up for him. So the guy finally left. And he said, well, I was waiting for him to leave. So I posed the question to Art Blakey again. They, they call him Buhena. I posed the question to him again. I said, is there a conspiracy to keep this music away from African-Americans. He said, hell no, they're just ignorant as hell. But he didn't mean ignorant in a very negative sense. He meant ignorant of their own culture. See, this music was created by African-Americans. Mm -hmm. It is the most sophisticated music in the world, created by the most sophisticated people in the world, African-Americans. We just need a little bit of help Letting, pe letting our own people know that we're sophisticated. This music, the reason why I have an advantage is because I grew up listening to this music. My father was a Count Basie man. My father was a mailman. He'd come home from work, fix, take his clothes off, fix himself a drink, and the first thing he would do was put some of this music on. Of course, growing up, I didn't, none of us liked it. We consider it old folks music. But if you're not exposed to this music, then it's very, very difficult for you to understand where it's coming from. Very difficult. So I Blakey also went on to say that the black ministers in the church tell the white, tell the parishioners, the people, don't listen to this music because it's devil's music. And white folks listen to it. See, there's so many, there's so many strikes against this music. That's why I call it American classical music. I call it because it's it is it has substance, it has a history, it has legacy, and it's written down. This music was created, the, the word jazz is actually short for jackass. It was created by, this is my opinion, it was created by New Orleans aristocrats when they visited the whorehouses in New Orleans, and they heard these black musicians play this music. So the first thing they, they said, when they, and, and they couldn't play it either. Anybody that they knew could play it. So what they did, they called it 
nigger music. So one of the most one of the more civilized brothers said, "No, don't call it that. That's not nice." So they said, "Okay, we'll call it." And this is my opinion. We'll call it cool music. And they said, "Well, no, don't call. It. That's not nice. Don't call it cool music." So they decided to call it jungle music. And if you look at some of Duke Ellington's early recordings, the recordings will say Duke Ellington and jungle music. So they decided to drop the jungle. And they named it J-ASS, short for jackass. The first band to record this music was a bunch of Europeans. And they called themselves the old Dixieland J-A-S-S -S band. And so later on, instead of calling it jazz, J-A-S-S, -S, they called it J-A-Z-Z. -Z. I was also interviewing uh, Amma Jamal once. Amma Jamal, the piano player. He performed here in Chapel Hill on, on the campus. And after he performed, I went to his hotel. And I said, the first, one of the first questions I, I posed to him was, I said, how long have you been playing jazz? And he frowned up. He said, I don't call what I do jazz. I don't use that demeaning term. I said, but what do you call it? He said, I call it Afro-American classical music. Hmm. Ellington never called it jazz. Duke Ellington called it Negro folk music. The flute, the uh, saxophonist, the reed man, Yusef Latif, doesn't call it jazz. He considers it, didn't call it jazz. He considered it a very derogatory term. He calls it autophysio, some kind of long, long word. You'd have to look that one up. My point is, the people, uh, and they, they asked John Coltrane, does he call his music jazz? He said, no. He said, but what do you call it? John Coltrane said, I call it John Coltrane music. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is that the musicians didn't give it that name. The people who performed the music didn't give it that name. That name, like, like a thousand other names, is a Madison Avenue was used so they could sell the music, right? Gotcha. Like hip hop, rhythm and blues, soul, all these phony names. You see, what, I what people you. need to understand is that this music is a reflection of the African American experience. That's all it is. It's not to be used to, for someone to exploit it or to make money. The parasites, like the agents. The club owners, uh, the the producers, and they're all Europeans. They're the ones who make the money off of this music. Mm -hmm. The quote unquote musicians don't. Some of them make a little money. Some of them, Duke Ellington died when he when he died. He was fairly well off. Miles Davis was filthy rich. Miles Davis was born rich. His father was a wealthy man. Duke Ellington. To me, Duke Ellington is the greatest American American classical musician and composer to ever live. He wrote over 2,000 compositions. Now, you can't get any more sophisticated than Duke Ellington. That's right. No question about it. And when I say this music is a reflection of the African-American experience, you have to go all the way back to the 1900s. Mm -hmm. And up until the era of the 1930s and the 1940s, with the big band era, now this music is protest music. You take a tune like Duke Ellington's tune, Sophisticated Ladies. Now he wrote this tune in the 30s. This is a protest tune for anybody to say that a colored woman, quote unquote colored woman, was sophisticated in the 1930s was protest. Because society, the white supremacist society, did not consider black folks to be sophisticated, but they didn't consider them to be humans. Actually, 
So this music reflects what's going on in society. And, yeah. and my contention is, after 1945, we entered an era that was called the modern classical music, a modern American classical music. It swung. There's something in this music called the element of swing. Like Duke Ellington said, it don't mean to think if it ain't got that swing. If it's not swinging, then it's not really quote unquote jazz. After, after 1969, the African American culture, musical reflection, has been on decline. But it's simply like what's going on here. That's all it's doing. I hope I answered your question. You did answer my question. You gave me so many more questions. I love, I did not know the history of the term jazz. So you have enlightened me, but I have heard it called American classical music. So I can relate to that because I've heard of it. And I was putting up these pictures as you were calling up names. And I, my exposure to American classical music was through my parents. Um, my dad, still to this day, I've lost both parents, but we still have the record collection in the right. house. I grew right. up on bait, on swing music and, and right. big band jazz. Right. That's because that's right. what my parents exposed right. me to. Plus, also, my mother played the piano and the organ. So all right. of her children, one way or another, we got exposed to music and not on, we were musicians ourselves. We played in the band. Um, right. She taught piano. My grand step grandmother taught piano. My grandmother, my mother's mother, who passed away when she, my mother was thirteen, I learned later in life before my mother passed that my grandmother played the violin. Hmm. So and she passed in nineteen forty three, but she was raised. Um, she went to the Avery Institute in Charleston. Then she went to Barber Scotia College outside of Charlotte. And she was raised, they were taught piano, organ, Good. And, and violin. We forget that, that Blacks learned, played all of these instruments. Uh, right. The banjo is not necessarily jazz, but bluegrass, but it's all connected, comes That's from right. West Africa. All these type of instruments come from West That's Africa. Right. And right. just like the Gullah Geechee, where we created a language that took African tribal dialects and English, Spanish, and French, and we made a whole new language, American classical music, these right. uh, African Americans took what they were given and created and evolved into this whole new musical genre. That's truly That's American. Right. And unless right. we understand that history, we don't appreciate it. And you made a point of saying, right. but I was taught that. I was exposed to it. That's right. You know, That's very important. If you're, yeah, it's, Ella it's Fitzgerald. Very important. That's who I grew up with. Ella Fitzgerald. Right. Duke Ellington. Even oh, yeah. We're well, very fortunate. Yeah. Yeah. So. Very. I was exposed to it. So right. I think part of what's happening, um, we're not being exposed to this music. So yeah. do you think, going back to what you were saying, that, oh, that's the devil's music? that somehow we got it twisted in our minds that it became devil's music, yes. a point of shame rather yes. than something to be filled with pride about. And it's, and let me tell you, right. American classical music is very complicated. Um, with the, the Alonius monk actually has written, I, I believe, math formulas based on his music. So right. it's very complicated music, yes. Yes. but relatable because as you said, it was protest music, sophisticated ladies, because blacks were not considered sophisticated. Right. But to write a song called Sophisticated Ladies, you're putting it right in your face. That's right. You know, the protest. Well, yes. There was another tune that was very uh, famous, written by um, Andy Razif. And it's been performed by several folks, been recorded by several folks. Um, Louis Armstrong did. I don't call him Louis Armstrong or Sashmo. That's derogatory. That's racist. His name is Louis Armstrong. Um, and the tune is titled, What Did I Do to Be So Black and Blue? 
Mm. Uh, and and what, what happened was he, these gangsters put a pistol to his head and told him to write this tune because they thought it was funny. You know, what did, even the mouse ran from my house. What did I do to be so black and blue? Mm. You know, so what happened was the, the tune became a hit. And these gangsters made a lot of money off of it. You know, so if you listen to the lyrics of it, um, it's, it's a very, very, um, it's in your face. But it, but it was it intended is. to make fun of black people. But it, mm. a reverse process happened. You know, uh, let me tell you this story. Now you were near Charleston, there was a place, there's an orphanage in, in Charleston, I think. Jenkins, <laughs> Jenkins Orphanage. Yes. Cat Anderson, who played with uh, Duke Ellington for a long time, attended that school. A lot of the musicians uh, who would later become famous musicians uh, went to that uh, orphanage. There's also a guy out of Charleston, South Carolina, who played with Count Basie for years, uh, Freddie Green. Let me tell you this story about um, Louis Armstrong that was told to me. Okay. By, by Jimmy Heath. Uh, Louis Armstrong was appearing, this had to be in the 40s, I guess, maybe even the 50s, um, at a hotel in Columbia, South Carolina, right? Mm -hmm. And his room was upstairs in the attic because he couldn't stay down, you know, in a, in a regular room with the other folks. So he, he was, they had him upstairs in the attic. So he got home from the gig, maybe about two or three o'clock in the morning. And he decided to go to bed. He was tired. And when he got in the room, there was a raccoon in the room. Somebody had placed a raccoon in the room. So he called the guy at the desk downstairs. He said, listen, hey, listen, man. There's a coon in this room. There's a coon in this room. So the guy downstairs on the phone said, yeah, we know there's a nigga in there. He said, no, I'm the nigga. It really is a coon. <laughs> so... And Dizzy Gillespie told this joke in front of the Dizzy Gillespie was was a native of Chara, South Carolina. Yes, he was. Bebop. Dizzy Gillespie told this joke. He was honored by the South Carolina General Assembly after he became mm -hmm. a world famous musician. And Jimmy Heath was performing with him during that tour. And Jimmy Heath was in the General Assembly when he heard Dizzy tell this joke. And he said that the, the European legislators was holding their faces. He couldn't believe, <laughs> believe that he would say such a thing. But Dizzy was, Dizzy was Dizzy. But he was a revolutionary. You see, all of these guys came out of that period. See, this is why I like to tell people that we're the most sophisticated people in the world. You know, all these guys came out of that period. They were dressed to the nines. They wore suits. You know, they didn't have pants hanging all behind behind, behind and behind and everything. Mm -hmm. But they were perfect gentlemen. Everybody had on a suit whenever they went to perform. That was their uniform, you know. Dizzy, had, Dizzy has been cited of saying that after 1945, 1945 was a very crucial year. It was World War II years. Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie led this revolutionary music that was called bebop which is also derogatory. I call it modern American classical music. They led this movement where the, the element of swing. Dizzy Gillespie said, we changed everything. We invented the word cool. We invented the word square, squares. We uh, invented style, dressing, people start dressing like we dress, wearing beret and that kind of thing, wearing suits. You know, so we know how to be sophisticated people. Mm -hmm. Well, after 1969, the whole the bottom fell out because you had to understand that when that when that rock and roll hit, the, the emphasis of rock and roll was to drown out the sophistication. Everybody wanted to be produce loud music and to recite nursery rhymes. You know, I'm not with this hip hop or this rap. It's very hard for me to get excited about a person reciting nursery rhymes. But at the same time, it's a reflection of what's going on in society. You follow what I'm saying, Marilyn? Yeah, has, a, as I was listening to you, I was gonna ask you that question. Is this a reflection of what's going on in society? Yes, yes. 
Yes. It's a very degenerate, loud, um, for the lack of a better word, ignorant, um, dumbed down society. You know, and, and the computer doesn't help. You see these people walking around all day looking inside, look inside a, 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 a little gadget. I call them give me some gadgets. It's a dumbed down society. And this music reflects that. Now how you how can you get excited about people reciting nursery rhymes? I don't know. What's sophisticated about a person getting on a mic reciting nursery rhymes? And besides, it's not new. Uh, Stephen Fletcher was rapping back in back in his era. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen did a, a, a spoken word album called Moon Maiden. But this is all an inst uh, instrument, a tool for people on Madison Avenue. They bombard you with all this stuff and make you believe that that's what's happening. Let me show you this book if, we, if I could show it to you. Yes, please do. You got it. You, yeah. move, there you go, so right there. Jazz and Justice. Jazz and Justice. Jazz and Justice. I would recommend that everybody reads this. By Gerald Horn, Professor Gerald Horn, Jazz and Justice. It tells you how the African-American musicians have been ripped off. Um, th th when they go to perform, when they go to recording studios, it's like buffet style, marijuana, uh, liquor, Wine, whatever they want, it's displayed right there for them. A heroin, cocaine, and they get these musicians hooked. These are the promoters, the record producers. They get them hooked, so they don't have to pay them anything, and it still goes on. Nothing has changed. They own the record companies. They own the, the restaurants, the clubs. They own everything. The Europeans control. They control all of it. You know, I don't think anybody should be surprised about that. Can I plug you know, my book? Yes, Not you now. can. Well, <laughs> I'm gonna. I want to ask you some questions because you you getting into oh, go ahead. something go ahead. Go ahead. when go ahead. you um. It's a reflection of society. Now you got me thinking. Right. You know. Good. And That's what I want and, you to do. and American classical music. Afro-American classical music, I'm going back to it's music that makes you think. And it really does. Right. Right. Uh, and you've given me even more layers now with the protest music because even though I was exposed to it, raised on it, it right. was from my parents exposing. It wasn't, they weren't sitting there saying this is protest music. But it stuck with well, me. they would never say that. Yeah, but yeah, even in my twenty, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know if they even right. realize it themselves. It was just their music. Right. But even right. in my twenties, I had an opportunity to work on a program where uh, the South Carolina Symphony did Duke Ellington's um, uh, "Black, Brown, and Beige Suite," I believe. Yeah. And yes. there was a particular song in there. The Three Kings. That's what it right. was. Right. And it was about Martin Luther King. Right. Jesus Christ and one more king. I can't remember, but it was called The Three Kings. Yes. But the but the layers of the music, the solo parts of the music, the clarinet solo, just and it and it touched on. I heard in that piece not only classical music, but I heard gospel music in it, the spirituals. Right. And I remember right. the night of the performance, people dressed very sophisticated because this was a symphony, uh, right. jazz, tapping their feet like they were in church. Right. And how that connected me to my church experience which connected right. me to my grandparents, my grandfather, who was a Baptist minister. Right. And it just right. reflected how jazz was, and still continues to be, jazz is so multi-layered. It's and spiritual. When start study, yeah, spiritual, but right. it's also mathematical. That right. I go back to Monk, who literally right. wrote 
the math formulas for his music. Right. And we've deliberately, now let's look at society where public school system has been under attack for the past 50 years. Right. Because, and that's nothing new because they attacked public school systems in 18 right. in South Carolina, 1895. The, right. the constitution that we still operate under changed right. how public schools are dealt right. with because public schools were started by black elected officials during reconstruction. Yes. You know, so think of the sophistication of thinking that had to take place coming out of recent enslavement to create the That's public right. school system for everybody. Right. You know, so our music is not just the spirituals, because I think if we just focus on spirituals, we actually do not do ourselves right. Because the root of blues, the root of bluegrass, the root of Afro-American classical music, American classical music, can all be traced back to West Africa. Better be living. I don't mean spiritual. I don't mean spiritual. I don't mean the spiritual. I don't mean the spirituals in a sense of singing gospel. I mean a spiritual feeling. Okay. Okay. A link to being spiritual. That's what I mean. Okay. I got you. I got you. I don't mean spiritual in in, in those terms. Well, I think but, most people will hear that spiritual the way, you know, like sure. Maybe worship of, in the church. It comes but out I, of the I, church. Gotcha. Yeah. It comes out of the church. You see, when I give a lecture, I give a lecture on the Carolina Jazz Connection because, um, and I'm writing my book on it. One of the things that we have to have to understand is that um, this music comes out of the church. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, you take the I, I have what I call the big four: uh, Thelonious Monk, John Coltrane, Nina Simone, Max Roach. They were all born in North Carolina. Thelonious Monk, when, when he was twelve years old, I don't think Monk finished school. Uh, when he was twelve, before he was a teenager, I think he went on the road with an evangelist playing piano for her. John Coltrane, both of his grandfathers were ministers. John Coltrane's father, grandfather was a bishop, Bishop Blair. That's how he got in High Point. He was born in a hamlet, but he got, he got in High Point because his grandfather had to move to High Point. Nina Simone, of course, grew up in the church. Her mother was a minister. She played in the church at an early age, before she was a teenager, I think. She started playing at age five and was in the church playing with before she was a teenager. Max Roach also grew up in the church. So that's what they all have in common. It's spiritual move, music in a sense that it moves the spirit, the African spirit, you know? So I, I like to tell people all the time, uh, and and made up. Sometimes, times some people understand me, and sometimes people don't. That it's the most sophisticated music in the world, created by the most sophisticated people in the world. Us, we just need a little help. And yeah, I hope what I do helps a little bit. I can't we say don't that think of ourselves as sophisticated. I, I uh, don't think we think about. I don't think we think of ourselves as sophisticated. I know we don't. Well, let me ask you this. Give me a give me a definition of sophisticated. What what's your definition? Well, you know how to treat people. You're courteous. You know when you sit at a table, uh, you're supposed to eat with one hand. You don't you don't proper etiquette that you were taught as a child. And you have sophisticated tastes, clothes, what you eat, uh, how you act. You know, you just don't act like an idiot or a gross person. And if I might add, we picked up those habits once we came, once we were brought over here. We picked up a lot of those negativities from the Europeans. Not all of them, but part of them, we picked up the 
those negative vibrations. Because as quiet as it kept, we weren't, our ancestors were not eating meat. We didn't eat meat per se until we came to this country, until we were forcibly brought over here. There was a lot of things that we didn't do in the ancient African civilization that we were exposed to once we got here. Uh, I like to cite, whenever I'm doing a lecture sometimes, I like to recite a poem, the beginning of a poem by Haki Marabudi, who was the head of Third World Press in Chicago. And he says, what happened to the black people who created the first civilizations and who produced the Great Pyramids? That's a question to ponder. And what happened to those people is that they adopted the lifestyles, the mores, and the ways of thinking of their enemy, the oppressor man. So we've been constantly trying to outdo our oppressor man. That's why we look down on, on anything that was created by African-Americans, anything. Uh, sometimes you see an African-American in the audience and they'll see another African-American talking and they'll look down or, or they don't want to believe what they have to say or, mm -hmm. or he's just another nigga talking. They do that all the time. So we tend to look down on our, old pe on our own people. And that's cause like Malcolm said, we are thoroughly brainwashed. So I guess the best way to answer, answer that question is well, how do we get the way that we got? Is that we're thoroughly, we've been thoroughly brainwashed. You know, we put high cones in our hair to straighten our hair out. We put bleaching cream on our face and, and we, uh, Dance when we ain't supposed to dance and scratch where we ain't supposed to scratch and grin in front of white folks' face all the time, thinking that they will accept you as, an, as, as, your, as their equal. They will never do that. It's not going to ever happen, you know, because deep down inside, I hope I'm going to get you kicked off the head. Deep down inside, they want to be like you. And you're wasting your time trying to be like your enemy, you know. So be proud of what your ancestors have contributed, be proud of yourself. Uh, I don't have any problems. I, I, I'm, I'm totally elated and fine with the skin that I'm in. I'm proud to be what I am. So until we understand that this music that's called jazz is the most sophisticated music in the world and it was created by sophisticated people, Duke Ellington, Delonious Monk, Miles Davis. You know, this music is accepted all over the world. It is. It's I was about it. There's something yeah. wrong with that. The Japanese yeah. love it. You know, the Europeans love it. Yeah. You know, let me let me point out something here. We're very fortunate in this area to have a 24-hour quote unquote jazz station. I worked over there for eight years, right? When I was working at my first jazz gig as an announcer, I would see people and they would say, but what do you do besides go to school? And I would say that I'm a jazz radio announcer. And they would say, well, what do, we, what do you mean you're jazz? Well, I was on at night. I said, what do you mean? We don't know what it sounds like. What, 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 do, you, what do you mean by jazz? But they can't say that today. Because all they got to do is flip on the radio on 90.7 and they can hear jazz for 24 hours. Not only that, with the internet, I, I listen to a station out of Newark, New Jersey, WBGO. You can write that down. That's a 24 hour jazz station. There's another station in the Bay Area, the Cal, uh, Cal San Francisco Bay Area, and that station is KCSM, which is a 24 hour station, right? White folks love this music. They don't even know why. Why do they love it? Because it's quality. That's why they love it. It's quality music. But it's going to be very difficult for our people to listen to. When I say our people, I mean Africans. To accept this music and listen to this music. Unless you've been exposed to it. If you're not exposed to it, it's going to be very difficult. I was exposed to it. I wasn't hooked in the beginning, but I didn't get hooked until I went to grad school and I gradually got hooked. 
on it. I write, I play, when I'm writing, I'm playing, I'm playing the music. When I'm reading, I'm playing the music. I'm listening to the music. It causes me to think. It soothes the savage beast, right? So our people are not going to listen to this music or appreciate this music unless they stop trying to follow white folks, Europeans. The, no, let me, let me qualify that. Unless they quit trying to follow the bad habits of Europeans. And there's a long list of those. <laughs> so, um, you know, I hope I- So, so you did answer it and thank you very much. My part of, and we have a, a viewer who also commented, intelligent. Man, that was my cousin. Hey, cuz. All right, that's your cousin. All right. That? Uh, and then uh, respect for ourselves. He lives in Colombia. Uh, okay, very good. Well, thank you joining for joining us today. Um, knowledge, sophistication to me is knowledge. Uh, right. We forget whether we have or we never knew that the first universities were in Africa. That's right. Or we forget that. Either you didn't University, know or you forget it. University of Santora. Santora. Yeah. 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 So, exactly. So right. if you don't have the knowledge that we had the knowledge right. and still have it because our ancestors are still there trying to tell us. That's right. That it's hard for you to get grasp the uh, Afro-American, yeah. American classical right. music. Yeah, and I talk about that right politically that a recent in the recent years we need more sophisticated voters. Right. And what do I mean by that? Knowledge. Right. We need to be informed voters. I believe everybody has the right to vote, right. even if you don't have knowledge, because that's supposedly this Democratic Republican, we supposed to have all the right to vote. Right? right but my desire is to have informed voters sophisticated voters which means you need to have knowledge about who's running for office you need to have right. knowledge about policy and issues so you right. can make an informed vote yeah. we are lacking that and yeah. that reflects what you're talking about jazz the american classical music that's about music but it's also about informing of us the public school system, uh, right. higher education, right. how we have dumbed down society. And people yes. talk about it and don't even realize how uh, broad out. the lack of knowledge is. Right. You're right with this music. Even, even I'm going to get on gospel music. There's a difference between the spirituals and gospel music that we listened to growing up in the church, which if you listen to the lyrics, were actually very complicated lyrics, very yeah. layered. Wade in the water was not just about going out in the water and wading. It literally was hidden messages in a lot of our music. Of now, course. when you listen to gospel music, it literally is repetition of about four or five words, the whole song. I hear you. Don't forget to put Jesus in there. <laughs> it, it, Jesus is one of the five words. You gotta put it in there. You know, it is. You listen to it. Better be white too. <laughs> you had a gospel song called Stump. Stump, folks. Stump. 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 And the choir sang Stump. Stump. And the person who, the lead, who does not sing, he talks the whole song. He would say the, the lyrics, the melody, but even when he said, would say stuff, it literally was repetition of four or five words. Jesus something something stomp right stomp that was what the choir was singing we've even dumbed down our gospel music and it's I don't okay. I know people don't want to hear that but it is we've got to really so so my question Larry then we're gonna get into your books because because we got about 12 more minutes how do we gain knowledge how do we reverse the trend how do we reverse the dumbing down of America. I don't have an answer for that. 
That's I an don't. answer. I mean, if you don't have an answer, that's your answer because it's it's I complicated. I mean, okay. it's, uh, I I um I, I've been at this since 1978. That was my first venture into this. I worked at seven different stations. Um, I was working at a station in Wilmington, North Carolina, a public radio station. And I had a nice shift. My shift was like from 10, 10 p.m. until 1 a.m. But I had to come to work early because, you know, to make some time. I come to work at about 5. I, I like to tell stories. So, and these are true stories. So I was coming into the station and I had a stack of albums. And it was, the station was near a local grocery store. And this black cat came by and saw me walking into the station. Now, this is a classical, European classical station. They play classical music all day. And so he said to me, hey, I didn't know they played black music at this station. So I said to him, I said, yeah, brother, jazz. You can't get any more blacker than that. And he looked at me as if I had landed from outer space. Wow. As if I was crazy and walked away. I've also had, I've also had people who have called me while I was in the air and said, well, I noticed you don't play no white musicians. These are the Caucasians, Europeans. And I, I had one guy call me one night, 2 a.m. in the morning, actually, and said, I was playing Sarah Vaughan. And he said to me, ah, oh, what is that you're playing? It sounds awful. I said, wow. Sarah Vaughan? So it's, wow. it's, it's been a struggle for me to try to convince our people to accept this music. So I've gotten to the point where I don't even try anymore, Marilyn. I mean, it's, it's uh, you either get it or you don't get it. Well, hey, put, it put it like that. You either get one it or thing you I've don't. learned, I've lived long enough and my desire to live a long time. I got things to do, God right. willing, and whatever yeah. your belief is, but that you do what you're supposed to do and don't worry about the rest. I don't. That's it. You put it out there. Yeah. I do what I do. Right. And people right. are going to either take it or they not. Right. And I'm, I not can't worry about it. I'm not running yeah. a popularity contest. That's right. That's right. Like me. That's right. Yeah, you know, and, and that's serving, it. That's it. I'm serving, I, only, my motto is to be a gentleman and a scholar and a servant of the people. This is... Uh, Programming American classical music is a public service. It's like a tidal wave of ignorance, and you're trying to swim against it. You know, but I choose to back up a little bit <laughs> and get close to the, to, to where the, the tidal wave is not coming, and just let the tidal wave die off, and then move back up a little bit more. You know, uh, I, I I choose the path of of least resistance. <laughs> Fair enough. I keep, I keep a smile on my face. <laughs> that's that's fair enough. Fair enough. It really it is. And yeah. that's what I wanted to hear. Um, so let's talk about your books in these last well, few minutes. Let's talk about your books. Well, what let me, so how do we order these books? How do let me, me know email. that? Send me an email. So this is okay. My book is actually, can you see this? Yeah. Move it. There you go. Okay, this is a movie. Okay. Uh, the movie is called I Called Him Morgan. Okay. And it's actually on on uh, Netflix. I Called Him Morgan. See? It's All actually right. on Netflix. It's a movie about a lady who I had a chance to interview. Her name was Helen Morgan. She killed this famous jazz musician who actually used to play with I Blakey uh, at, at the age of 33. She turned out to be one of my students. I interviewed her, and the, the producer and the director of this film was a Swedish cat, a filmmaker. And he contacted me, and he wanted to use the interview in his movie. So I said, yeah. And the movie's been from here all over the world. Uh, I wrote, as a result of that, I wrote, I wrote a book. I can go to the right, huh? And the book is titled, The Lady Who Shot Lee Morgan. So okay. I've been pretty busy between the movie and, and my book, uh, working to let people know who Lee Morgan was, uh, let people know 
about this tragic story. Um, so that's what's happening. I'm writing a book now called The Carolina Jazz Connection, uh, which cites the mere, mere fact that there are over 75 uh, American classical musicians who were born in North Carolina. So that's what I'm doing now, as we speak. I spent up. I was up last night working on it, or this morning. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to put this. Uh, your email said so contact. If you want to order the book, contact order the books by contacting Larry at lrt0393 at hotmail .com. Yes, that will work. All right. All right. So this don't is go, been a don't go to, don't go to Amazon and don't go to these other sites because they'll try to rob you. You know. Uh, but I, my price is reasonable, and not only that, I'll autograph it for you. Very good, <laughs> very good. He, you actually told me when I met you in Georgetown. You told me about the story, the the, the first yeah. one. Oh, yeah, it's a heck yeah. of a story. But go to Netflix. It's on Netflix. I called right. him Morgan. That's the name of it. But if you want my book, just send me an email. I'll send it to you. All right. All right. I called him Morgan's on Netflix. If you want to purchase the books, you can go to his email. It's at the bottom of the screen, folks. Please support our author, support Larry, because I, I just love this conversation that we just had. Larry, I'm going to try to play some um, uh, Duke Ellington music really quickly. In our last few, let me see if I can get it here. Okay. Um, oh, you're very good you know, at what you do. I, I want folks to hear it. Now, we just not hear, you know. Uh, right. One time we got the gonna play some music. that's contemporary yeah. jazz. I got because it, don't mean a thing. Let me see. I'll play that one too. That's a good one. Can we hear it? I can hear it. Don't mean a thing if you ain't got that swing. A thing, all you gotta do is swing. Makes no difference if it's sweet or hot. Just give that bit of everything you got. It don't need a thing if you ain't got that swing. Everybody like, was dressed up. 
I know. And that's, yeah, I mean, and I miss that. I miss that. I miss going to places where, uh, and especially with the men, I've noticed the women will go to these, um, uh, award shows and stuff you see on TV dressed to the T and then there'll be men with t-shirts and jeans on and I guess those are dress up jeans I don't know but it, it oh, does a yeah. disservice it really does a disservice to the community yeah. a time um, and a place for certain things you know if you if you that, that's that's called sophistication if you that's right if you have to know how to dress and how to act don't act like an idiot anybody could be an idiot you know so yeah it, it doesn't take much does it no, it's a tough task. You know, if, if you don't get it from home, where are you gonna get it from? You know, so yeah. it's 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 not it's not an easy task in this day in this day and time. There's, there's so much negativity out here, and yeah. people seem to be gravitating to this negativity. You know, um, it's 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 unfortunate, but I just stay away from it. You know, I I've learned to stay away from it, and I I'm a survivor. I'm still here. Still here. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yeah. Larry, it's been a me. wonderful conversation. Thank you for coming Thank on. I'm going to bring you back. We got we got a plan on bringing you back uh, to right. talk some more. Uh, I know you're working on some more films. Uh, yeah. We are we, you know, Wilmington on Fire. Some more stuff okay. is coming up. I want you to come back and talk about that. And okay, of course, we'll the do. film festival. We're gonna have to bring that back to the film festival, and we'll Good. bring you on to talk about that too. Bring out Colin and Morgan. Do some book yeah. Bring out Colin Morgan. Bring out Colin Morgan to your film festival. Okay, yeah. we could do that. We'll do that. That's a, Carolina, that's a Carolina connection. She was from Wilmington. Yeah. Okay. And it's that's, that's from it. South Carolina. All right. That hey, that'll work. We'll bring that to the film festival. I'll make sure okay, cool. Amy, our film festival organizer, is aware of that, and we'll make cool. it happen. We'll make it happen. Make it happen. All I right, know. Larry, it's been good. I really enjoyed having you on, and Thank we can you. bring you back. All Thank right, you. now. All Thank right, you, you take care now. All right. You too. Bye bye. Well, y'all, that's Larry Rennie Thomas. You guys, twenty-four hour jazz station. He's a jazz. Uh, has he said? American classical music, and it really is. And you know, maybe it's time for us to really think, rethink this, and become more sophisticated in the way we conduct ourselves, in the way we think, and our knowledge. It's about having knowledge, folks, who we are, our history, and of course, our public school system. And I just enjoyed everyone being here, and we listened to some music. Go to YouTube; it's out there. Duke Ellington, all these names that we call Dizzy Gillespie. The Theolonious Monk, uh, Miles Davis, they're all out there on YouTube. Y'all, let's get more sophisticated and um, let's make this happen for our community. Thanks for joining us today. We are back on Sunday at four o'clock for a gathering place. And um, oh, we're going to be talking about the upcoming We Goja Foundation Cultural and Historical preservation conference that's happening April 20th through the 21st with Miss Janie Harriet. It'll be pre-recorded, but come on, join us and let's have a good time and learn some information. Thank you, everybody. Y'all have a good day and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you and good night.